Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us on this webinar where Dr. Oka, our course tutor, will be answering your questions on choosing the right microscope for live blood analysis. My name is Elizabeth Clemens. I'm the presenter of the Live Blood Online 12-week training course where we teach live and dry blood analysis to uh, people all over the world. Um, if you would like more information, please see our website or email us at, inf at uh, uh, info at livebloodonline.com. Uh, more about that later. So we get so many questions about choosing the right microscope for live blood analysis that we decided to put this webinar together where Dr. Ocker our course tutor and microscope export expert will really explain what is needed for live blood analysis. We realize that a microscope is a huge investment and this can put people off if they don't really feel confident that they're making the right choice. So I'm going to be asking Dr. Ockers some of the most common questions as well as some of the questions that you have submitted. And you can also submit questions uh, during this webinar by locating the questions box in your panel. You should see uh, a questions box um, somewhere there on your panel. Put your questions in there and we'll endeavor to answer them throughout. Uh, if not, then we'll answer them at the end. And also, please stay with us if you are considering buying a microscope, as Dr. Ocker will have a very special offer on microscopes at the end of the webinar, just for attendees of this webinar. So, um, Dr. Ocker, thanks for joining us. Would you please explain, first of all, what exactly are dark field, bright field, and phase contrast? Are they lighting systems? What are they, and how do they work? All right, yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, um, you know, there are, there are uh, lighting systems that are used in microscopy, um, and they're basically, it, it's just the um, way that the light is transmitted through the sample. So um, this all happens before the light actually gets into the blood sample. Um, so it happens under the stage, and this is usually by means of um, types of lenses called condensers. Um, so with a normal bright field type of condenser, the light is simply allowed to go uh, directly straight through the sample, um, and that's the, the normal uh, way of, of viewing um, samples normally with, with standard laboratory microscopy. In dark field, it's it's slightly different. The light is actually scattered around in the sample, and effectively the um, sample is then illuminated from the side. Um, so instead of the light traveling through vertically, um, it's actually illuminated horizontally in the sample, and this is by um, means of a dark field condenser that's used under the stage. Um, phase contrast is also a type of, of lighting system used in microscopy. Um, and that's a little bit more difficult to explain, but it makes use of the different um, refracted indexes of, of different uh, um, items in a sample. And the sample is then basically, or, or rather contrast, is created in the sample um, from the interference then of different path lengths of light going through the sample. So um, it's about being able to see the blood cells and the plasma which is the, um, uh, what the blood cells are suspended in, and the background as well as just the blood cells. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. You know, with the normal bright field uh, type of illumination, we're not really able to see everything that you could potentially see in a sample, uh, especially when it comes to live blood. Um, and this is the reason why blood samples normally um, are uh, stained, um, just to allow um, the person analyzing the sample to actually see all those other elements um, that you can't normally see with the normal live unstained sample in bright field. Um, so in dark field and also to a certain extent phase contrast, it allows you to see those other elements um, and effectively um, the sample is then stained by light instead of uh, by chemical means. Oh, I see. So in classic hematology, they tend to stain instead. Why don't they use... Um uh, light field and bright field and dark field? Well, that's a, just an interesting question. You know, um, a lot of your hematologists would still argue that you can't really distinguish um, the different types of white blood cells, for example, using an unstained sample. 
um, which is of course completely incorrect if we look at uh, our course materials and how to identify the white blood cells correctly. Um, but it, it's uh, perhaps just what is taught in at university level. Um, there was actually a, um, a hematologist and pathologist uh, during the 1960s and 70s um, that uh, really uh, supported the use of phase contrast and dark field in viewing uh, live samples and he uh, tried to, to uh, uh, encourage uh, pathologists to actually use this technique um, because he believed there's a lot of value in uh, looking at samples while they're still alive instead of uh, looking at samples once they've been, been killed off by all these uh, stains and chemicals that are used. Mm, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. So um, for our attendees on this webinar, why is it important to view this webinar before buying a microscope? Could you explain, please? Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, for, for many practitioners, um, using a microscope is a completely new experience. You know, as practitioners, we usually train in nutrition and herbal medicine and, and other natural modalities that allow us to help our clients, um, but we're not normally trained in microscopy. And when you start researching microscopes, you actually find that this is, is quite a complex field uh, with its own terminology or, or language, if you like, um, just like any other discipline. And normally, um, you know, when we need to invest in a piece of equipment, we rely on the expertise of people who uh, work in the field uh, to help us make the best decision. Now, the challenge is, however, that uh, many microscope suppliers out there uh, simply do not know what is required of a microscope system uh, to perform live blood analysis properly. Yeah, it's very surprising when you look at all the different microscope systems that are available. Many of them claim to be dark field microscopes, but some of these systems are very cheap as well. And we often get attendees asking us if these would be suitable for live blood analysis. So why are these cheaper microscopes not suitable? Could you explain that, please? Yes, and you know that is one of the questions that we'd uh, like to address with this webinar. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that it's very important uh, to have a suitable microscope system because if you don't, then you simply won't be able to see what you should be able to see in, in the blood. Uh, and the risk is that with a, a cheaper system, you may then end up with a, a dark field image that looks like this following image. Just have, a, have an example of that. All right, there we are. Okay, so with one of the cheaper systems, you would tend to have a, a dark field image that looks like this, whereas um, it really should look like this next image. I can see there's a huge difference between the images. Um, one of them is much more magnified than the other. Um, what are the main differences between these systems? Well, the first image that we looked at is from a 20-watt laboratory microscope. Um, now, this system has all the standard specifications for uh, routine uh, laboratory use uh, with none of the changes that are necessary for live blood analysis. Um, it has a 20-watt halogen light source uh, with a dry dark field condenser and the uh, standard on-screen magnification as well. Now, the second image is from a um, high-definition or HD LED microscope. Um, now, this particular microscope has a 9-watt LED light source. This is equivalent to a 100-watt halogen. Um, it has an oil immersion dark field condenser and then also increased on-screen uh, magnification. Now, we'll go through all of these um, in, in, in detail. Um, regarding all these features to show you how they affect the live blood image. But the most important factor that sets these microscopes apart uh, and determines the price is really dark field. Um, now, there are a very strict set of requirements for dark field analysis in uh, live blood specifically. 
Uh, many of these microscopes do have uh, dark field capabilities, um, but when it comes to analyzing live blood, they, they're really not actually suitable. Um, so I don't really think that it's a case of uh, microscope suppliers intentionally deceiving people, you know, claiming to sell dark field microscopes that are not suitable for dark field. Um, it's simply that they don't know what really is required uh, for viewing live blood in dark field. Oh, I see. So they actually don't know um, uh, what's required, and that's why they, they're say, simply saying they're, they're good for dark field. Um, I know the course is not exclusively based on dark field analysis. We have many live blood anomalies that have examples in both bright field and dark field. And of course, dry blood analysis is, of course, only done in bright field. But how important a role does dark field play in live blood analysis? Well, dark field analysis or, or being able to analyze blood properly in dark field really plays a, a critical role in, in live blood analysis. Um, now, there are some anomalies that can only be seen in bright field, and there are some that can only be seen in dark field. And that is why we always take a look at a, at a blood sample in bright field first uh, before going over to dark field. Um, however, I only usually spend less than 10 minutes on bright field because there's so much more uh, that we can see in dark field. Uh, often the anomalies seen in dark field would be really fundamental to the case and um, they would determine the direction taken in terms of treatment of the case. So if you're not able to view uh, blood properly in dark field, then you would miss those anomalies and the treatment that you decide on in a case uh, may then not be the best and the most appropriate for your client. I see. So. Um this would also affect your experience as a practitioner with live blood analysis because you may not see the results you expect to see in the practice then. Well, yes, absolutely. This is a, a very important uh, potential pitfall uh, to watch out for when incorporating live blood analysis into your practice. It's really critical that you that you have the correct system. Um, you know, nobody wants poor results, not the practitioner and, and also certainly not his or her clients. Now, I was very fortunate that when I initially started analyzing uh, blood, that I was able to start uh, from the very beginning with a very good quality microscope system, very similar to the 50 watt uh, units uh, that we have now. And over the years, I've seen consistent, really great results with live blood analysis in my practice. So, you know, I have no doubt of its ability to highlight uh, the most important issues in a case. And for me, the two main reasons why uh, some practitioners uh, may not see the results they expect to see with live blood analysis is firstly, uh, their level of training. So if they're not familiar with all the potential anomalies and, and what they could mean, um, then they won't be able to use live blood analysis properly. And then secondly, if the microscope system uh, isn't suitable for live blood analysis, well then they obviously wouldn't be able to see all those anomalies that they uh, might be aware of, but their system wouldn't allow them to actually see those. Okay, I see. Um, so in the invitation to this webinar, we mentioned that not all microscopes are created equally. As we mentioned earlier, some microscope systems are very cheap, whilst the microscopes used for live blood analysis tend to be more costly. So what are the reasons for the higher price tag on the um, live blood analysis microscopes? Well, supply and demand plays uh, plays a role here. Um, microscopes that are mass produced are usually much cheaper, um, but these all tend to have the uh, same standard specifications um, that all normal laboratory microscopes have, and none of these are, are really suitable for live blood analysis. Uh, when a mic where a, a microscope has been manufactured also plays a, an important role. Uh, generally, microscopes that have been produced uh, were produced in China are usually much cheaper. Um, and most of the microscopes that are available online are actually from China, even those uh, sold on websites in the in the USA. Um, now, the main problem with Chinese microscopes is not that all of them are of an inferior quality. Um, some of them are actually quite good, but many of them are, are not good at all. Um, and it's not always possible to tell them apart, and that really is, is the main problem. Um, so it comes down here to the uh, components that are used within the microscope. 
you know, I've tested microscopes and I've, I've seen microscopes where the actual gears in the uh, focusing mechanism uh, in the microscope were made of cast iron. Now usually these components are made of harder wearing materials such as brass uh, just because of the constant wear on these parts. Um, so cast iron gears are of course uh, much cheaper to manufacture um, but they're really not going to last long at all. Oh I see, wow that is a bit shocking. So. Um... Reliability is obviously very important because you're going to be using your microscope every day on each and every client. And the last thing you need is for it to suddenly stop working or break down. Well, absolutely, yes. And because it's such a, a specialized tool, uh, it's unlikely that you'll uh, have another one lying around that you would be able to use. Definitely. So uh, build quality and the quality of the internal components are some of the factors. What are the other factors that determine the cost of the microscope? Well, other than the build quality, there are a few other factors. And um, you know, to discuss them, I, I have to get a bit technical here and resort to using some of the uh, terminology used in microscopy. Um, but I'll explain everything as we, as we go along. Um, so firstly, Let's just talk about the objectives. Now, on a microscope, the objectives are the lenses that are usually found just above the stage uh, that provide and uh, determine the different levels of magnification. Uh, now, the basic entry-level type of objectives are called achromatic. And this means that only the central 60% of the image that you see in the viewing field will be focused and uh, color corrected. The remaining 40% around the edges will actually appear blurry. In the slightly more expensive semi-plan objectives, the central 80% of the image will be focused, and then the most expensive objectives are called plan achromatic, and they produce an image that is 100% flat, uh, in focus and color corrected. Um, now what they mean with color corrected objectives is that uh, all the colors of the uh, spectrum will be visible in the viewing field. Um, so in the cheapest objectives, the achromatic objectives, only the central 60% of the field will be color corrected. Now this means that the uh, color of objects outside of that central area would not actually be correct. Uh, the other important issue with regards to objectives is the uh, numerical aperture. Now this simply determines how much light uh, an, obje an objective will allow through into the, uh, through into the eyepieces. Um, now this is quite standard for most of your objectives when it comes to, um, but when it comes to dark field we need a lower aperture uh, than the standard uh, aperture size for the large 100 times objective. Now if you use a standard 100 times oil immersion objective uh, in dark field, you would not really be able to see much at all unless you're able to adjust the aperture. Uh, the most expensive 100 times objectives uh, come with a built-in iris diaphragm and that allows you to adjust the aperture in the, in the objective. Without this feature, a, a hundred times objective uh, on a microscope is actually of very little use in live blood analysis. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, hundred times objectives um, that have this feature, this uh, built-in iris diaphragm, uh, are usually quite expensive. They normally sell for around $300, and that's, really, that's just for the objective. Now, to illustrate this, we have an example of a, a live blood sample in dark field using a normal plan achromatic uh, 100 times oil immersion objective. Um, now this is the cheap type without the built-in iris diaphragm. And you can see there's not really that much that you can see there at all. Um, compare that then to this next image um, and this is actually of the same blood sample but using a 100 times objective with a built-in uh, iris diaphragm. And you can really clearly see the difference between these images. Uh, the objective without the iris diaphragm allows through too much light. Um, and that is really why we can't see that much at all. Um, there's just too much uh, reflected light in the sample, uh, which makes it basically impossible to see anything. 
Okay, so the amount of light that the objective allows through plays an important role, especially in the 100 times objective then. So the type of dark field condenser you use also affects how much light is allowed through into the sample, is it? Yes, yes, it is, absolutely. You know, when it comes to the type of dark field condenser, um, the oil immersion type is the only one that really should be used for live blood analysis. And the reason for that is again related to the amount of light allowed into the sample, uh, which then determines what you'll ultimately be able to see in, in the sample. So we have an example here of an image of uh, live blood um, using a dry dark field condenser. Right, so this is also with a LED microscope, um, but it's with a dry dark field condenser. And then the next image is where we've used an oil immersion dark field condenser. And this is again the same sample. Much clearer. Now you can see with the much, much clearer, yeah. And you can see with the dry dark field condenser you you're really not able to see much detail between and inside the cells. Um, now this is, as I said earlier, this is the same uh, blood sample and you can clearly see that with the dry condenser um, we can't really see any of the target cells or uh, many of the chylomicrons. microns, whereas with the uh, image with the oil immersion condenser uh, we can actually see target cells and chylomicrons microns um, all very clearly visible. Now, if there was anything less reflective than, than chylomicrons, microns, um, like for example fibrin or signs of fermentation, um, you would not have seen it at all with the, with the dry uh, condenser. I see. So uh, again, it's um, a lot to do with not just the blood cells, but actually what's happening in the uh, background as well, yes? Absolutely. That's actually the reason why we uh, use dark field is, um, you know, most of the of the cells and the, the red cells and so on, you can see quite clearly with bright field. Um, but with dark field, we really want to be able to see the smaller, finer structures between the cells in the plasma and also inside of the cells. So the dark field allows you to actually see um, in the cell, uh, whereas with, with bright field, you're not able to do that at all. Yeah, it's very clear. Now, both of these images were taken with the same microscope, is that right? Um, the only difference being the type Correct, of dark yeah. fields, the, the only difference being the type of dark field condenser used. However, the brightness of the lamp or light source also plays an important role, doesn't it? Well, absolutely. It's actually one of the uh, most important factors um, that determines whether the system will be suitable for live blood analysis. Um, now, most normal microscopes easily 95% or perhaps even more of uh, the microscopes that are available have a 20-watt lamp. Um, now, this is not nearly bright enough for dark field analysis. So, um, you know, some of the so-called uh, dark field microscopes have a 30-watt uh, lamp, um, but even these are still not suitable and bright enough for dark field. So, to be able to see the structures that you want to see in dark field, you need at least a 50 watt uh, halogen lamp and this will produce enough brightness to then illuminate those small and fine structures between the cells. Anything less than 50 watt uh, will not produce enough brightness and uh, well you'll essentially see what you saw in bright field um, but only against the dark background. The standard 50 watt system that we recommend is a 50 watt halogen system but the most popular system is actually the LED system, isn't it? What level of brightness does the LED system produce? Well, the LED system has a 9 watt LED lamp. Now, this is equivalent to uh, almost a 100 watt halogen. Uh, so, it's even brighter than the 50 watt halogen system. Um, uh, there are some LED microscopes available out there on the markets, but um, again, 99% of them uh, have a 3 watt halogen, uh, or rather LED lamp. Uh, which is again not nearly bright enough for dark field. Um, the 9 watt LED um, that we have is actually quite unique to our systems. I've not come across any other microscopes uh, with the same type of LED. Um, the only equivalent really in terms of brightness would be a, a 100 watt fiber optic uh, cold light source. 
So to illustrate just the differences in, in what you'll see in dark field um, based purely on the strength of the light source, um, we have a few examples here. Now the first um, image is an example of a, a live blood sample in dark field using a, a 20 watt halogen and here we've used a dry dark field condenser. And if we look at the next image, this is the same sample, um, also with a 20 watt um, microscope, but this is where a um, oil immersion dark field condenser has been used. And you can see that with the oil immersion condenser, it's not quite as bright. The dry dark field condenser allows through more light, um, but even even with uh, more light being allowed through into the sample, we're still not nearly uh, close to where we should be, uh, which is this following image where an LED microscope was used with an oil immersion condenser. Yeah, you can really see the difference there. Very interesting. The magnification range is also quite important, isn't it? Live blood analysis requires a different setup with regards to the magnification to camera. Um, could you explain what is requir required here? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, this is actually a very important feature and uh, one that will again play a very big role in uh, one's ability to observe all the anomalies in the blood. Um, now normal microscope systems are, are set up in such a way that the, micro, the magnification that you get on the screen, um, so through the camera tube, is the same as the mag magnification through the eyepieces. Um, now in most situations this makes sense, um, but in live blood analysis we actually need a magnification of at least a thousand times on the screen when we're analyzing the blood. Uh, anything below that won't allow you to see enough detail uh, to properly distinguish between and, and assess uh, the different anomalies. So if you have a standard microscope set up to achieve a magnification of a thousand times on the screen, uh, you would need to use a hundred times objective. Um, now if your objective is not the expensive type with the built-in iris diaphragm, uh, you wouldn't be able to see very much at all uh, as you saw earlier with that um, cheaper 100 times objective, which means that you'd have to use your uh, 40 times objectives and that would then give you a magnification of only 400 times on the screen. So with our live blood systems, what we've done is to increase the magnification on, uh, to the screen four times. Um, so this means that if you're using your 40 times objective, uh, your on-screen magnification is actually 1,600 times, uh, which really is ideal for, for live blood analysis. Uh, the other benefit of this is because the 40 times objective doesn't uh, use any oil, uh, you're still able to switch back to the smaller objectives if you still need to scan around in the sample a bit. Um, and then you still have the 100 times objective available to you that you can use um, when you need to really zoom into a particular cell or microbe um, and then using the, the 100 times objective will then give you an on-screen magnification of 4,000 times uh, which is also very unusual uh, for microscopes in general uh, but it's of course ideal for, for live blood analysis. So to illustrate this we have a few images uh, just of a specific area in a blood sample um, and this first image, um, well, this is just an, an, a comparison between a 20 watt microscope with a um, normal condenser and let's just go back to the previous image and the uh, ideal picture of what we want to see and you can actually see the difference there very clearly um, between the two two examples. So going on to the, the next example is where we have a specific area in a blood sample and this is with a standard um, on-screen magnification um, that you would normally get with most of the other microscope systems. So if you're looking at that central structure there, the monocyte, that's the white blood cell um, roughly at the center of the screen there. Um, now using a system where you have additional on-screen magnification, um, you can actually clearly see the difference if we look at the next image. And uh, 
and then finally, if you um, if you were to increase the magnification to the maximum level using the 100 times objective, uh, you would then get this image so you can really see how close you are getting to this. Wow, you can really see the difference that the additional magnification makes, can't you? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> being able to show clients a live video feed of their blood on screen is really central to live blood analysis. And this is, of course, achieved by attaching a camera to the microscope. Now, I've seen microscopes that have cameras attached as an eyepiece, but the recommended way is to have a separate camera tube in the microscope. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yes, definitely. Um, well, connecting a camera uh, to one of the eyepieces is really not the ideal way of doing it because you are sacrificing one of your eyepieces. And also because the camera then being there, it, it makes it nearly impossible to then use the other eyepiece. Um, the best way, as you said, is to have a, a dedicated camera tube in the head of the microscope. Now the term used for these types of microscopes is uh, trinocular, whereas the microscopes that don't have a separate camera tube are called binocular. Okay, now the type of camera connected to the microscope is also very important, isn't it? Is there much variation in the types of cameras available for microscopes as well? Well, yes, there is. Um, and again, here we see a, a fairly wide uh, price range between different types of cameras as well. Um, now, the first thing to look out for is whether the camera has been built specifically for microscopy. Um, now this is really important because if it's not a microscope camera, uh, then you'll often end up with spots on the screen um, that you just won't be able to get rid of. Um, now these are actually minute imperfections on the uh, components in and in front of the camera sensor. And uh, if they're there, there really is no way of actually getting rid of them. I've tested many cameras over the years and some of them have had so many spots on the screen that you're really not even able to see the, the blood clearly. Uh, now the manufacturers and suppliers of these cameras are, are usually quite shocked when, when they see this um, because when the camera is used normally, there are of course not, not any spots visible. So I had to look through some of my old images here to find an example of what these spots would look like. Um, now this is a, a live blood image in Brightfield where some of the spots are visible. You can see quite a quite a large number of them. Um, you can see there's, there's quite a few, but I've actually seen much, much worse than this. Um, using a camera like this, uh, I su suppose you do get used to the spots and you uh, learn to, to ignore them, um, but each and every client will ask you what the spots are and uh, you know, that can become quite frustrating. Uh, now, the image that we have next is with an HD camera uh, that's specifically developed for microscopy. As you can see in this image, there aren't any any spots visible. Yes, that's much better. Mm. Yeah, and then the next thing to look out for is, uh, well, not only the resolution um, of the camera, but also the frame rate. Um, now, the frame rate is how many frames the camera produces per second. Um, this is usually abbreviated as FPS, or frames per second. Now, um, in digital cameras, the higher the resolution of the camera, the lower the frame rate usually is. Um, now, there are some digital cameras that boast a, a very high uh, definition or resolution of up to 10 megapixels, um, but then the frame rate is only 5 frames per second. Um, now, this means that the video that you'll then see on the screen uh, will really not be very smooth at all. Uh, now these cameras are, are better suited to applications where there isn't really much movement in the object that you're viewing. Ideally, in live blood analysis, a camera should have a, a frame rate of at least 25 frames per second, uh, which again narrows down your, your options in terms of high definition digital cameras so quite dramatically. I see, thank you. And um, does Darkfield play a role in your choice of camera as well? 
Well, yes, it does. And, you know, also just the fact that you're viewing samples in both dark field and bright field. Um, to do this, the camera needs to be able to adjust its uh, exposure uh, properly between bright field and dark field. Um, now, this is not always achieved by the camera automatically. Um, so often one would need to adjust these settings in the camera software. And this is then another factor to consider because um, some cameras don't have the, the most user-friendly software available. Oh, absolutely. And not all of them are compatible with all operating systems, are they? Well, absolutely, yes. And this, again, well narrows down the list of options because uh, not all cameras are compatible with both Windows and Mac. Um, and some cameras don't even support Windows 8. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So there are quite a number of factors to consider when choosing a microscope for live blood analysis. And it seems that dark field plays a very important role here. Now, you mentioned earlier that there are many anomalies that can only be seen in dark field and that these may vary, uh, may um, uh, be very important to the treatment of the case. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Which anomalies are only visible in dark field, please? Mm, sure, absolutely. Well, you know, some people, when they hear dark field, um, immediately think of pleomorphism, and uh, they choose then not to do dark field because they're not using pleomorphism themselves in, in their analysis. Um, but there are actually many other very important anomalies um, that can only be seen in dark field. Now, the first one that comes to mind is uh, fibrin, uh, which is, of course, related to liver stress. Uh, this is a very common finding in, in live blood analysis and really important to be able to see that at, at an early stage. Um, the column microns, now those are those small motile particles that move around in the plasma, those are only seen in dark field. And then also most of your white blood cell anomalies are only visible in dark field. Now, these would include um, assessing the lobes within the neutrophils and other white blood cells, um, assessing white blood cell viability and also um, the white blood cell count. Also, we're able to see uh, target cells more clearly in dark field. Um, it's easier to distinguish between various types of crystals in dark field. And there are also certain microbes like uh, L-form bacteria that uh, can't really be seen in bright field. Uh, and then lastly, if you're not re even if you're not really planning on using pleomorphism, I still believe it's quite important um, to be able to see the various pleomorphic growth forms um, because they tell us so much about the state of the terrain. Uh, I've seen many clients where the um, normal live blood anomalies were not all that unusual, uh, but a high number of advanced pleomorphic growth forms were seen, uh, which then indicates that the treatment of the case needs to be uh, more focused and specific to improving the terrain, and that progress in these cases will tend to be slower uh, because of the length of time that the terrain has been uh, compromised for. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So are there any questions at all, Elizabeth? Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, any more questions, please pop them in the box. Um, what about, one of our attendees has asked about the general upkeep of microscopes. What, is there much upkeep? Are there many replacements? Is there much that people have to do to um, uh, keep them um, uh, in, in a good state, basically? In a good state, yeah. That's a, quite an important question. It also um, varies from supplier to supplier. A very important question would be to ask about the, the sort of warranty period. Um, so on the microscopes that we supply, there's a two-year warranty on it. Um, and generally, they, um, because all the components are, are, are closed off within the microscope itself, there really isn't much need for, um, for maintenance as such on the microscope. As long as you're covering the microscope with the dust cover that's applied um, after, after use um, to protect it from dust, um, there really isn't much else that needs to be done. Uh, people often ask about, you know, the effects of, of, of um, climatic conditions if it's really a, a damp environment that a person's working in and whether uh, uh, 
there's a risk of, of fungal growth um, on the lens components. Well, um, most microscopes and certainly the ones that we supply have a, a type of treatment on the lenses to actually uh, prevent that, that from developing. And that's also why we um, recommend that no solvent uh, materials are used when cleaning and wiping the lenses. So very important um, not to try and clean any of the internal components of the microscope. It's best just to keep everything closed as it is um, because it's, it's completely safe that way. Okay. And would you suggest having um, an annual checkup or... Um Anything like that? Well, there are the, the things that one would one would need to check is just the alignment of the various components. Now, inside the microscope, everything is 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 uh, set in place, and there's very little chance of anything happening there. Um, but specifically, the condenser, the um, little lens unit, low the stage. Um, that's something that, that sometimes when people start using the microscope and they're still uh, not quite sure what to adjust and where to adjust, um, this is something that people sometimes uh, adjust by, by accident and um, then the condenser is not always perfectly aligned in the center of the beam of light. Um, but this is a fairly easy and simple procedure. This is something that, that an attendee, um, you know, the person using the microscope can actually do themselves. Um, it doesn't really require a, a specialized microscope uh, uh, technician to, to do. Um, in terms of maintenance, that's also um, with the uh, halogen type of microscopes, with the normal halogen bulb, um, that's a consumable item. The uh, halogen bulb needs to be replaced uh, fairly regularly as the, um, as the bulb gets old. It, it, it breaks and then obviously you need to replace it with a new one. Okay, so really not that much maintenance, and they're actually very hardy, aren't they? Well, absolutely, especially because these specific microscopes have a very good build quality. Um, they're made of, of, of uh, good, durable materials. Um, everything is, is um, set in place, and it's uh, quite resistant uh, to use and, and uh, uh, um, a fair amount of abuse as well, so if there's a bit of traveling involved and you're going from one practice to the next, um, it's, 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 there's very little chance of any, anything breaking because it's been moved around. Okay, good. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about the special offer on microscopes, please, that is just available to attendees of this webinar? All right, yeah, absolutely. We've got um, four uh, normal systems that are available um, based on the, well, one, the type of, of illumination, the light source, and uh, secondly, the type of camera that's supplied. So on those systems, we have a, um, a discount of 15% of uh, for the attendees of this webinar, um, for uh, attendees that order before the end of the week. So that's a 15% uh, discount on all of our microscopes uh, that are also they're available on the website, yes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. there are, and it's, it's 15, one five, not five zero. <laughs> right. So uh, have a look at the microscopes, get all the information on the um, website, which is, um, where are we? It's at the beginning. It is www.liveBloodOnline, so you'll be able to get all the information there. And a 15% uh, discount on microscopes uh, just till the end of this week. So if you are considering, please go and have a look. Choose your microscope. If you have any questions, let us know because uh, we can answer them. Dr. Ocker will be able to help you um, choosing between the four different options there. Um, so uh, we have another question. How long can you expect the bulbs to last? Would that be in the halogen or? Uh, is it yeah, it's mostly yeah. that would mostly relate to the halogen. The halogen um, bulbs do tend to go. You could expect to replace at least one one bulb a year. Um, it might be more often depending on how how regularly the microscope is used and how long. Um, the light is, is left on, 
Um, the process to change the bulbs is not really that difficult. Um, the main problem really with it is, is that uh, the bulb tends to, to go while you're busy with, with, with the client, um, which is a bit inconvenient. And you'd often, most practitioners, it is human nature, we tend to forget where we've left the, the spare, so it, it uh, causes a bit of chaos in, in, in the practice. Um, and that's why the LED system is a lot more uh, popular, because um, the LED light source has a very long lifespan. It's, it's completely maintenance-free, um, and it, it lasts for at least 25 years without having to replace uh, any of the components. Okay, so um, we have four options available, don't we? The top of the range, uh, which is an HD LED, and Correct, yes. uh, that is priced at how much is that? Uh, that is priced at five thousand six hundred and sixty-one US dollars. Okay, and what are the other three options? If you just remind our uh, attendees. Right. Well, the, the top of the range unit is the most most popular. Um, that has a high definition camera, and then an LED light source, and um, then we have a system with a, a LED light source and just a standard definition camera. Um, the third option is a system with a standard definition camera um, and a 50 watt uh, light source. And then we have a system with an LED light source and a high um, a standard definition uh, camera. Okay, marvelous. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to know more, go to the website. And also, um, if you'd like to take advantage of this offer, then please um, send us an email at info at liveloodonline.com and um, we'll get in touch and arrange everything for you. Um, okay, so anything to add to that, Dr. Ocker? Um, no, I think that's I think that's basically all. Unless there are any other questions, we don't seem to have any questions at the moment. If you do have any questions, please put them in the box. No, there's no questions. Perhaps we should also. I'm not sure if we've mentioned it already, but the um, prices also include shipping to um, to your address as well. So that's a 15% discount and uh, free shipping as well. Um, and also, if you'd like to know more about our online training course, um, please email us and we'll send you um, an information pack. Again, that's uh, info at livebloodonline.com. So um, thank you very much for joining us. We hope that that's been uh, useful to you. Please let us know if you would like more info, if you'd like to take advantage of the offer. And uh, we have a course currently running, uh, which is the 12-week online training course. Um, we have a new course starting in September, uh, on September 27th. So if you'd like more information on that as well, please um, email us. Um, so do we have anything else to add to that, Dr. Oka? No, I think that's all. I think that's all, unless there are any questions. No questions. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.